put on something else, and then see if she just remembered something else. We just remember to say something else. Yeah, right, far away. Another memory of mine, I suppose I would be about 11, and one Sunday lunchtime, my dad came home with a young airman with him, and my father had found him sort of looking around Aylsham, and he had a word with him, and he said he'd just been stationed at Alton and didn't know his way about at all. So by my dad being, as my dad did, said, oh, you come home with me and we'll see if we can find you a meal for the day. So my dad brought him home, this young airman, he was only about 18. And um, after, ever after that, when he wasn't flying, he used to come to our, my home, our home, and we had some lovely times with him. And even today, we are still in contact. He has oh, never lost touch with the family. His name was Norman Story, and he now lives in Eastbourne. But he still keeps in touch. We still keep in touch. And when both my parents died, he came all the way from London. He was living in then for their funeral. And I've got lovely letters that he wrote to my brother and myself, thanking you know how wonderful it was that my dad and mother opened their home up to him in those days. But I think it was because my brother and sister were away that he just felt so sorry for him that he'd got nobody round him and he was stranger to the area. Oh, Brief <laughs> now. Tell me when you're ready to go. Yeah, we're ready. Right. Yeah, you tell me when you want to uh, go for it. Well, my, my first regulation with the the war was in 1939. My sister and I were on a holiday with my grandmother in London. And my father came up and brought us back very rapidly on the bus. But while I was there with my grandmother, my two uncles, <clears throat> I remember... Sorry, I'm going to stop it. Oh, start again. Yeah. My first recollection election of the war was in 1939. My sister and I were staying with my grandmother near London and uh, my father had to come up because my mother insisted that he brought us back as quick as possible. But while I was in London, almost the night when war was declared or the second night, uh, I heard all this noise in the night and uh, when I went for my bedroom, there was my two uncles, Uncle Horace and Uncle Charlie, putting on their uniform because they were reserve, um, army reservists, and they, they had their rifles with them as well, actually, and they were both off to Aldershot. And I thought, well, things are starting to hop up. Anyway, um, as you know, nothing much happened for about six months after that. Anyway, we got back to, to Elsham, and... Um, what happened then? We were still at school. I joined, I would, be about, I would be about 11, 11 and a half when the war broke out, I think. And all I can remember is um, a lot of activity with the army. We had, as I said, the Welsh Regiment stationed in Elsham. And they used the courtyard of what is now Barclays Bank for their exercises, they used to have their brain gun carriers in there. And my friend Kenny Beerick and I, we wandered around and we went in there and we saw a, a captain and a second lieutenant and then the other army officers there. And Kenny went up to this captain and said, they tell me your brain gun's not much cop because the, the barrels get too hot. So the captain pointed to a pair of legs sticking out of a bingo and carrier and says, go and talk to that Sergeant Novotny. He comes from Czechoslovakia, a place called Bruno, where the gun was developed. And he'd tell you all about it. Anyway, this man got out and he spoke reasonable English and explained to Kenny the fact that it was very easy to change the barrels and everybody carried a spare barrel. Anyway, all in all, we had a, a shoulders all round, and it was a very interesting day. 
Can I, when you say uh, the Welsh Regiment were, were based, did, did based in Aylesham, does it, were the soldiers in the camp nearby, or were they living in people's houses? Or? I don't know where they were. I don't know. Where were they? Park. Oh, they were Park. I'm sure they were. You better check out the Who was down at the station? The old station? Essex. Essex, right? oh, Essex. Oh, Essex down the station. Um, yeah, I don't know. But they used the back of the... Uh, to repair their bingo carriers and overhaul them. The, what is now the back of Barclays Bank. Um, oh, yes. Anyway, I've, I've, eventually, um, when I was about 13, I was two, missed two years, haven't I? Let me digress. My next recollection of the, the war was the searchlight down on the back of the school, which I believe Alan's mentioned, and also the fact you couldn't go any further than Ingworth, because from Ingworth to the coast was completely banned. You, you had to have a special pass unless you lived there. And um, you, you were talking earlier about uh, about the bridges being mined. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, the, the, when the army came, they. I remember watching the soldiers uh, mining the bridges, particularly the one that, at uh, Millgate, where they sort of dug this sort of hole there and put the explosives down and then seal it all up. They mined all the bridges. The one at the top of Hungert Street, the, the railway bridge at the top of Norwich Road, near the station, and uh, I imagine they probably done the English one, but all the bridges were mined. But I mean, they, were they weren't mines laid on the top, the explosive was buried under the bridge and, and that was arranged just in case. We never had too much activity at all till about, um, I can't remember exactly when that would, when that would be. Did they, had they built the uh, the pillboxes. The pillboxes just before in thirty-eight. Or I can't remember. It? I can't remember when they built the pillboxes. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember when they. Yeah. I can't remember when when they built the pool. But I know. I knew that. Uh, I remember the formation of the the Home Guard. When they all they had was these armbands and the LDV and and most of the farmers used to carry on twelve balls till they got issued with rifles. But um, my next real recollection is joining the civil defence as a messenger when I was, I was sort of really about 12 and a half to 13, which is a little bit below the age. But, um, and we all used to, uh, we, used to s we were based under the town hall and that was manned every night. And we, I think I used to, go down there two nights a week and I used to like to go down on a Saturday night because on a Saturday night that was when all the activity happened because all the various troops had come to the the dance hall and uh, very often some of the WAFs or the ATS would miss their transport back to the camp and uh, Mr. Charlie and would kind of let them spend the night down in the bunker with us on a stretcher. <laughs> So this this is under the town hall. Under the town hall, yes. The bay is still there. Under the bay, there. it was just quite quite a big cellar down there, and uh, Mr. T uh, the the, the, um, the head of the, the civil defence in those days was uh, uh, Charlie Ewan, and then Mr. Tilson, who was the manager of Henry Pages, and um, we had. Uh, Quite a number of people there. Major Ram was down there, and um, George Spilling, his father, and um, I've got a few photographs I have to dig out of those. And um, then of course we had ambulance drivers down there, uh, Mrs. 
Bond and Mrs. Rivet, they were down there. And um, we, uh, there was two, there was two or three ambulances. They were private cars with just a trailer on the back to carry stretchers. But uh, it was uh, quite exciting down there. I remember. Tell us, give us a bit more of a description of what the town hall was like when it when it was sort of set out during the war time. What do you mean, as the dance hall down there? Well, so, so you had dances in the you had dances in the main hall. Yeah, dances in the main hall. If you if you could start that again, as sort of put it. Well, on a, so, so, on a Saturday on a Saturday night, the dancers were in the main hall. Next to the main hall was a small place which the Women's Institute used to supply um, sandwiches, soft drinks and tea. And they were very, very busy. And then you had the, the band, which were very good. I think it was about a four-piece band. There was, a, there was a lady pianist. I forget her name now. Yes. She had a get. She uh, had a. Williams. She had a gammy Iris leg. Williams. Iris Williams. She yeah. was brilliant, and then there was a chap from uh, Roxham, who because they were building motor torpedo boats at Roxham, he worked at Roxham and he played the drums, and um, then we had uh, somebody on a trumpet and something. Oh, it was it was a very good band, and um, they used to get everybody coming in. On a Saturday night, you get the um, the RAF. If you saw if you saw them there, you had every nation. You used to see the RAF with the uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Poland, Norway. They were all there, and uh, then because eventually the Americans came in later on, which really I mean they used to come in wearing wearing their guns, and. Um, Young, as young boys, we used to think as one we used to sit around because the only, we couldn't dance very much, and the girls would sometimes at the end of the dance they would let us dance the waltz with them. But we used to really enjoy the atmosphere there, and uh, as I said, there was usually a few fights at the end of the day. But uh, Saturday, uh, Elsham on a Saturday night was virtually like a wild west town. There's no doubt about that. Just describe what the basement was like a little bit. The basement, the basement was, um, the basement consisted of racks of bunks, mainly, <coughs> and, um, and, a, and, a, and a couple of desks with telephones on, and uh, that was it. It's just, just a brick, you know, it was, cool, but it was a bit uh, dull down there, and, uh, but uh, there used to be about seven or eight people down there every night. One of the uh, one of the people I remember was Mr. Ward, the grocer. Do you remember Mr. Ward? He used to drive the uh, the ambulance driver. And um, it was quite nice, quite, you know, quite nice down there. The only toilet we had was the one at the top, just outside in the, at the back there, the new toilet, remember? Because one night made, we got a bit bored one night, so George Spillinger, uh, and I, we, we, uh, we used to make tea, and we decided to, to make Major Ram's tea and fill it with global salts. And the poor man, he spent all night up top with the toilet, but he never found out who did it. But, what was um, the purpose of your being there? What was your job? Messenger boy. Yes, but what did you do? That's what Well, made did. tea. Like, well, actually, because we never had any bombs or what else, we never had any messages to take. <laughs> We were there, you see, we were didn't there. Did play cards, John? No, we didn't play. I feel we did, actually. Um, we used to sort of be up there, what's, what was happening up top? Uh, we, we, most of the time when we got involved was when they used to have civil defence exercises, which were quite frequently. And um, we used to go around and um, things like that. Uh, there used to quite a number of civil defence exercises. And we were either casualties or helping generally, but... Uh, I do think the civil defence, even when Norwich got bombed very badly, uh, I don't think we got involved there as well. But I can remember, another, another reason I remember is, 
all the aerodome. We used to go around all these aerodromes having a look. All the aerodrome didn't have much in the way of protection. I had a twin Lewis gun at each corner of the field. And one night, the Germans came and they shot Alton up. And they killed quite a number of people. They shot the uh, the nuts. And my bedroom was on the Elton Road opposite Walker's the solicitors. And about two nights later, I heard this rumble, rumble, rumble. So I jumped out of bed and looked and I saw four army trucks going past towing and the aircraft guns. And apparently they took these guns to Alton. Anyway, about a week later, these the Germans made the mistake of coming back to Alton, where I think they sh shot one down and damaged the other one. And the next night I heard rumble, 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 and they took the guns away because there just weren't enough guns to go around. I think it was just a deterrent to say, don't come back again. And these all little incidents, but it just shows just how desperate things were in those days. But, um, and also, at one, at, at one time during the war, there were so many aircraft being shot down or landed uh, and crashed that they, they couldn't get guards. The RAF used to put a guard on them. They couldn't get guards on them. And um, in the end, they would just go there quickly and just take the, the bodies away and then just leave them. And we'd be at school and somebody would say, oh, there's a flying fortress down near Abel Heath. And after school, we'd all bike on our bikes and go down there, and we were cutting pieces of perspex out to make rings. And, and I saw one boy actually almost cut the, the insignia on one of them. And the funniest thing I ever saw, there was a, a paper boy on his, a, a, a gruesome boy on his trade bike. And a pair of twin browning guns had actually been thrown clear of the turret, and they were laying. Now these guns, the barrels were something about five or six feet long. And he says, help me put them on my bike. So we did, we put them on his bike, and he leaned on them, and he's biking down the road with his damn twin brownies sticking out. <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't get very far because he sort of took his weight off there, and because they tipped, dug in the ground, and he went completely somersault. So he said, I'll leave the buggers there. He says, <laughs> we went. That's the sort of thing that happened. And I also believe, although I've got no actual factual information. I believe a lot of ch children used to pick up live ammunition and take them home to make petrol lighters. And they used to put the thing in the vice and hit the end and because the case was split. And I do believe, I can, I'm not sure, but I'm sure there's one or two around here who used to lose fingers because of that. And an eye. And an, oh, and an eye as well. Really, yeah. yeah. They used to pick up this live ammunition. Um, on when I left school, I just regret, when I left school, I went to work at Lawrence and Scott's in Norwich. And sometimes I'd stay on a Saturday night to go to the pictures. And one night we're coming back on the bus, and we're just approaching. Um, the hill past Heavingham Church and it was a double-decker bus and this plane, this was in the evening, this plane came hedgehopping across and started firing and the bus driver stopped, put all the lights out and we all jumped over the, the hedge. And then when it had gone we, we carried on. Sunday morning I biked back with Kenny Bewick and we looked and it looked as though the road had somebody been over the pneumatic drill. We went in the field next door and we found one of these bullets. It was a 20 millimetre. And I remember taking it home and putting it in my father's vice, unscrewing it. And it was full of what appeared to be hundreds and thousands. That must have been a tracer bullet. So, I mean, you know, we just didn't realise just how dangerous some of these things were. I don't remember anybody being hurt by any of these um, anti personnel. Thing is that you know, the butterfly ones used to come down. Do you remember them? No, no, no. I don't remember. There's, I remember there's a posters up, there was posters up about these butterflies, but I n we never saw any of those. But um, what else have I said got here? My brief. Um, what about the machine gunning in town? Oh yeah, well that, that well that 
one well, on one occasion, we, I was leaving the school to be in there about three, three, three thirty in the afternoon, and we had to walk through the churchyard and to the home. And I was in the church. We were coming through the churchyard, and we heard this sort of rat tat tat tat, -tat and. I actually saw the plane. It was a, it was a what they call a, a flying pencil, a Dornier, and you could actually see it in the news perspective. You could actually see a finger, and it sounded so far away, you know. And we got behind the gravestones, and we thought that was hilarious, but. So far away. Yeah, it, it it seemed so far. It seemed so far away. Um, although, as I said, we, we could see the figure in the in the end of this Perspex news, and we hid behind the gravestones, and uh, we thought that was you know quite an exciting incident. Unfortunately, um, I think a Henry Page. A gruesome boy with his bike was standing in the marketplace and he actually got shot in the stomach and they took him across the surgery but he survived. I don't know, I can't remember who it was, do you? Know? Morris who? Green. I can picture him, he was dark and had a very round, fresh face. So, yeah. Somebody said it was uh, Nelson, but that wasn't Nelson. No, that wasn't Nelson. I think he actually worked in the warehouse, this, yeah. this lad. Yeah, he's a warehouse yeah. boy. Apparently... I had a feeling he came from yeah. Yeah, I had a feeling his surname was green. But they, somebody said he was standing next to him. Apparently he didn't feel the bullet. He sort of apparently said, that's a bit close for comfort, and then collapsed. So, uh, you know... <laughs> Bullets don't hurt all the time, apparently. So did you see that? Did you see the markings in the road? Were there bullet markings? Oh, I saw that. Oh, that was from that was from the bus. That was from these twenty millimeter one. But in the marketplace, I think that must have, we never saw it. It must have been the odd, the odd bullet. Well, they said there was some in what was Clark's the Iron Man. What is it now? Insurance. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. And Lester. Yeah. Apparently, the bullet holes were in that, that cable end there. The, uh, just, just going back to the, um, during the war, they used to have uh, um, ARP or civil defence exercises, but they also, they would have um, army exercises in which the, um, the local home guard would be versus uh, the, the, the the local army group, and um, they were issued with blank cartridges and thunder flashes, and because they were running around everywhere, throwing these thunder flashes and firing off, and of course some of the um, some of the home guard, the farmers, were a bit over over sort of um, over what zealous. over zealous as a word, good word, and uh, they would bring their uh, 12 balls along and uh, some of them would actually empty the the shot out of their 12 ball car just, just leaving the pad in there and unfortunately uh, George Spilling who was a messenger who was crawling uh, creeping around one corner and a farmer was coming around the other and as they met he accidentally fired and the the pad went into his cheek and all his face was spotted with, like, uh, from, from the powder. And unfortunately, George died about six weeks later from tetanus, which is tragic. Yeah. But, um, but the people down, uh, the people down, uh, uh, some of the CD personnel, or the civil defence personnel, were, was included Major M, Stacey Williams, Reggie Bates, Mr. Ward the Grocer, not forgetting Mrs. J. Bond and Mrs. River, God bless her heart. But, uh, the Marlins? I think Mr. Marlin, yes, 
Go right, Mr. Marlon. He right. He was he was down there as well. Um, that's right. And of course, another another one who was very much in Red Cross was Mrs. Purdy. Very elegant lady, wasn't she? Very elegant lady. Did you notice? Did you notice things you think were different at school because of the war? Um, well, yes, we did. Oh, yes, we certainly did. Because, yeah, I must tell you this, uh, our headmaster, Mr. Um, Bell. Bell, he was, um, he was actually a, um, in the auxiliary air force, he, was a, he used to wear his air force uniform quite a lot. And most afternoons, we had lessons in the morning, most afternoons we would have to work out in the gardens, dig for victory. And there also there was a, another big garden at the back of the police station. And um, as I said, we, we used to virtually spend every afternoon in the gardens. One day, he, re he, apparently he rearranged the garden plans, and one day he said to me and uh, Derek Pardon, do you remember Derek Pardon? He said, uh, I want you to go and dig over plot number 120. So we went out there and we, we spent the whole afternoon, we dug it over, and I said to Dave, this doesn't need much digging over. Anyway, we dug it all over. The next day, we were really in trouble because apparently we had dug up 140 rows of Elsa Crag onion seed. Whereupon we was pulled in front of the whole class, branded as friends of Hitler, <laughs> saboteurs, and we were then confined to lessons every afternoon to study arithmetic and maths, which probably helped me a lot. So we didn't do any more gardening. We were off gardening duty then. Yes, he said we were friends of Hitler, saboteurs, and that was it. And we really got into trouble with that. Where, where were the gardens that you were? Well, the, the, the gardens that we, we, we did the damage to was actually in, in the side of the school. But there was also, because of the war effort, they had a very large garden at the, on Hayden Road at the back of the police station. Very big one there. Because I remember larking about there one day and I actually had a fork and I sort of threw it like a a javelin, and Derek Pard stepped in the way, but I went through his leg, you see, whereupon I had about six or seven whacks. I had more cane else from school than anybody else, for some unknown reason. I remember Don who said, do you think you've had enough? I said, no. <laughs> no, I, don't, I think that's about it, really. I don't, I said, well, When the war was declared in September 1939, I was nine years old and I lived just on the outskirts of Arnstrom on a country estate about a mile from Arnstrom. I used to walk into school every day. I remember that Sunday morning vividly because uh, in the cottage next to us lived my grandparents. And I remember my parents and grandparents being very serious. But to me, it was the unknown excitement. Uh, I learned differently within a couple of years. Anyhow, school continued. We were flooded with evacuees. Uh, to start with, we had uh, a boys' grammar school come to Alsham, and they had to transfer to North Walsham after a month. But whilst they were there, there was 30 billet in Woodgate House. And we had four in our cottage on the estate. Uh, three of them were from a Jewish family. And the parents used to come through at weekends and visit them. And they kept in touch with us for many years. School, oh, school was vastly overcrowded. And we started in the spring going to school mornings one week 
afternoon to the next. And the period we weren't in school, we had to go on nature walks to Abel Heath or other outskirts of the town. They realised as winter was approaching that this couldn't continue. And that was then that they took some of us, the older ones by then, to the um, Baptist Chapel, where there were two classrooms, uh, one in the lower part and one above. I remember one of the teachers was a Misty Cole. I can't think the name of the other one. Mrs. West. Mrs. West, yes. Who was, uh, Misty Cole was one of our Elgin teachers. Mrs. West came with the evacuees. She was very famous for throwing chalk and she never missed. As Mary said, we had to go into the chapel when the siren sounded, which was frequently, often, most days. And we would crowd onto the balcony. When I can remember all these wonderful marble angels and that around us, and we were told we were very safe there. I shudder to think what would have happened. The nearest we came to danger there was when, one morning I think it was, we were playing outside amongst the gravestones. Uh, and there was a dog fight taking place over our heads. And to people who don't know what a dog fight is, it was one of ours and one of theirs. And I think it was the dear old Spitfire on our side. I can't remember what the German plane was. But we all stood there like young ladies at the time, mouths open, gaping upwards, watching the tracer bullets. Uh, and I think they just chased off. I can't remember either of the planes being terribly... Um, you know, damaged or coming down. Uh, I also remember going along with the others to have our gas mask fitted. And one of the things that I do vividly remember, and which I hate it because it was so claustrophobic, was that for a certain period every day we had to wear our gas masks for lessons. And I can still shut my eyes and smell that rubber. After about a year, we had to have another device or bit fit onto the gas masks, which was done at school. It was another bit taped on. I don't know for what reason, to make them more efficient, I suppose. Uh, life went on. We joined the Junior Red... We had to join the... We had to join something. We joined the Junior Red Cross. Recently, when I showed my grandsons a picture of me in my uniform, they sort of thought I was a nurse cavil of the day. And then I told them what we really got up to, which amused them greatly. As Mary said, we used to act as casualties, or we'd roll bandages, or make slings, or just generally fool around quite a lot of the time. Where I lived at Woodgate on the outskirts of town was across the fields about a mile and a half from Blickling and Alton, and I had an uncle and aunt live in Blickling, so I used to spend quite a lot of time there, mainly because it was absolutely heaving with airmen. Uh, I did even get into the sergeant's mess, which was in the farmyard of Blickling. Went to one or two dances. I was a bit young for that, but I got there. And that was then that I think I realised the seriousness of war, because you'd be chatting or dancing or generally larking around with young men who didn't really appear to be that much older than me, although they must have been about five years older than me. By this time I'd be about 13. And then the next night, or a couple of nights later, you'd go along and they wouldn't be there. They hadn't come back. And that was then that you re I began to realise the seriousness of war. Also living at Woodgate, we were in the direct path when the Germans came over to bomb Norwich. My father and uncles had made an um, air raid shelter in the top of our garden. But I remember vividly standing there and watching the aeroplanes going over in what appeared to be a direct line over us, over Causton Manor. And in the darkness of the night, Norwich didn't seem that far away over the fields and you could see all the fires starting up and the general bombs dropping and it was rather horrific and frightening. And I know my father saying to me, get down the shelter, get down the shelter, and I wasn't able to move. I suppose I was just paralysed with fear. Anyway, time went on. I left school and I started at, towards the end of the war working in a shop in town. 
rationing by now was getting quite serious and uh, we were allowed two ounces of cheese, two ounces of margarine, two ounces of butter and a half a pound of sugar. My father found it very difficult to manage on his half pound of sugar. He would do anything to get some of ours. There was also a point system and I remember this because at that time my first job was with the pool delivery. All the shops got together because of the petrol rationing and uh, on various days of the week the vans from the shops used to take turns but they would deliver for the other shops as well. And I used to have to count the points and things when they came back and you had points for dried fruit and all various things, custard powder and that. And I know you could have custard powder one month or corn flour or dried fruit the next month and this went for quite a lot of products. And it went on for a long time after the war. Um, yes, we got used to the siren going. And the all clear was lovely. The siren was a wail for the warning, but a lovely clear sound for the all clear. But we never did um, hear the church bells, because if we'd have heard the church bells, we would have known that the Germans were here. The church bells were held, if there was an invasion, the church bells would ring. The only time they rang was on VE Day, which was a wonderful sound. When you, you talk quite a lot about rationing, can, can we go back just to touch, just tell us what was different about the way the family ordered eating and so on. If a youngster was listening to this now, they'd think, well, why didn't you take something out of the freezer or <laughs> why didn't you pop down the supermarket? Not many people have no. fridges, isn't Well, it? yeah, if you could just sort of go back and say the way things generally worked at home. With the food rationing, um, one didn't have freezers to pop into or fridges. They were quite unknown. We did, when the chickens were laying well, Mother used to have a pail of, I think it was called water glass, and preserve eggs. Um, surplus fruit in the gardens, plums, raspberries, etc., would be made into sugarless jam, which was a bit uh, runny. Um, vegetables, beans, I know green beans we would preserve in a um, kind of brine, salt them, salt them down, and um, I suppose the sugar stood out in my mind more than ever because my father had such a sweet tooth and mother got so exasperated that she used to give each of us a basin with our half pound in and um, father would slip you a penny for some of your sugar very, uh, very easily. He was in the home guard. My mother had to do part-time work in town in a shop. My sister had to join the land army. Did you each you have much meat to eat? Uh, two shillings worth a week. Can, can you say we, we had two The meat ration uh, was two shillings per person per week. Um, I think how we, by this time my sister was in the land army and living away from home, so the three of us there, I think she used to put two together so we could have a joint, a four shilling joint at the weekend. And the other two shillings would be spent on something during the week. And even in those days, when there's a vast difference in money, uh, a joint of four shillings didn't go that far. So it was a case of the gravy one day, a slice of warm the next, and probably rissoles or something the next. And uh, that was how we... But we were very healthy. Now, were you going to ask him something about the crash? Yeah. The air raid warning used to have a warning if they were in the area, and then there used to be a crash, which meant they were actually all at the top. I can't remember that. Yeah, I remember yeah. the crash. Yeah, mm. the crash was particularly in Norwich because when I worked at Lawrence of Scott, mm. if the warning went, all the women workers and those that wanted to could go out in the shelter. But then when they were in the immediate vicinity, there was a crash warning, which meant you then got, we well, used to have surface shelters, or you get on the bench, or whatever you wanted to. But the crash meant, the warning meant they were approaching the coast 
all come to the air, but the crash meant they were actually overhead. Can't remember that. Yeah. Did you want my bit on the uh, machine gunning? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, let's get that I remember, along with the others who have spoken this morning, being in the actual school playground when the German plane came over machine gunning. I was aware of the plane, although I couldn't describe it, but I do vaguely be been aware of it, and hearing this noise, almost like hailstones falling all around me. Um, but we must have been on the way home because some of my friends were in school lane, some were in the actual churchyard which led on to the town. Um, but nobody was hurt, that was the wonderful thing about it. Although I always felt realised we were children coming to school. Right, well, just a 